Hello and welcome to the Qubit Guy podcast, brought to you by Classic, the quantum algorithm design company. My name is Yuval, and my guest today is Elicha Kiyoseva, quantum computing scientist at Boringer Ingelheim. Elicha and I talk about quantum computing in the pharma industry, the composition of their quantum team, the degree of competition and collaboration between companies, and much more. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please let us know how we did by emailing hello at classic.io. That's hello at CLASSIQ.io. Hello, Elitza, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Yuval. Thank you very much for having me at your very cool podcast. So who are you and what do you do? My name is Elitza Kiyoseva, and I'm a quantum computing scientist at the German pharmaceutical company, Beringer in Gelheim. Previously, I was in academia, and I have been uh, working on quantum computing on several continents, including Asia, North America, and currently uh, the Middle East. Uh, I'm based in Israel. Uh, working in pharmaceuticals, I think there are a lot of use cases that people talk about why it could be fantastic for the future for pharmaceuticals. But is there something that can be done today with quantum computing? Or do you think pharmaceutical companies are just preparing for a distant future? Um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And the truth is that the biggest part of our effort is really to prepare for the distant future, which in our eyes is, of course, fault-tolerant, uh, error-corrected quantum computers. So the majority of our use cases and really uh, the problems that we are looking at are uh, facing uh, and answering the question of will it be possible to implement uh, these algorithms on a photon and quantum computer. However, even um, very recently, two weeks ago, we actually released a paper with one of our partners, QCWare, and it is about NISC uh, calculations, where we show that uh, uh, using uh, NISC uh, quantum computers can bring improvement to calculating binding affinity. So this is really a step forward that, we, that is showing already a tremendous progress for the NISC. Yeah. How large is the team, if you can tell me? How large is the quantum team? Yeah, it is, uh, it is public. It is not a secret. We are five people, uh, which is actually pretty large. I know quite a few companies are already ramping up and hiring as well. So soon this will not be a big uh, uh, news, uh, but we were probably the biggest uh, team in an industry, especially in pharma. And uh, all of us uh, have PhDs and we all come from the traditional way of, you know, going through the universities, uh, getting technical training. And then we, uh, we kind of diverged. So we have a person uh, that was a postdoc at uh, Harvard. I was uh, uh, personally even at a venture capital fund uh, before I joined uh, BI. Uh, we have IBM, Volkswagen, and the University of Bristol. So we are a diverse team, but I would say everyone is uh, quite highly uh, technically skilled. When you talk about diversity, is it also diversity in education? I mean, putting aside where the education was. So for instance, you have computer scientists and pharmaceuticals, or everyone is a computer scientist or, or physics major? What is the sort of structural composition? So from my perspective, it's diverse, but it is diverse only from the quantum computing stack. Uh, so we do not have people that are really, uh, let's say, classically trained uh, quantum chemists. So all of us, uh, our focus of our training was quantum computing, but uh, but basically zooming in on different parts of the quantum computing stack, all the way from uh, algorithms and implementations and applications, uh, but also all the way down to the hardware. So personally, my background was in quantum control, and I was looking at um, uh, quantum optical problems of how co can we control the qubits in a robust way. So I was really looking at uh, uh, error mitigation of the quantum hardware. Do you think that full stack experience is going to be necessary in the future? I mean, I think you're quite unique that you work in the hardware and in the software and so on and so on. But wouldn't people want to get more abstraction and say, well, yeah, I understand what a qubit is, but 
I don't really care what the process underneath look like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, ultimately, I think it will be important to do to do both. And software and hardware have to meet in the middle. Uh, so it is nice to to abstract uh, our algorithms and really to focus on. Uh, uh, applications. Uh, however, this can become quite detached from reality very quickly. And uh, many of, even if you think about many of the NISC works and the NISC algorithms, they are still uh, noiseless. So for many of these uh, results, actually there are no, no noise models that are implemented on the system. Uh, so Ultimately, it is very important for people to uh, to keep a connection to reality and especially to to the lifetime of the qubits and exactly of the different noise processes that are in the system and design the algorithms with that in mind. Of course, this is for NISC algorithms, for the ones that we want to see in the near term. Uh, for fault tolerant, I think there you can still be quite um, uh, you know abstract and, and focus only on the algorithmic mm-hmm. level. Do you get input from the pharmacist or the chemist, or is the group separate right now? How how much integration is in terms of cross-functional integration? Yeah, actually, we work a lot on being very integrated within the company. And for the first several months, we really went and spoke to more or less everyone from within BI that had anything to do with computational research. Uh, in order to identify our use cases. And still for every use case that we work on, uh, we do have an internal specialist, someone that is actually encountering this problem that we want to solve with quantum computers in their uh, in their work and they work with us and they help us you know stay grounded they help us define the use cases uh, the the different uh, let's say physical systems that we want to um, to solve uh, with the algorithms so i would say that we are actually quite uh, quite integrated within the company of course we are still kind of an island so we are the quantum computing lab and uh, we are not part of, let's say, a bigger department or something like that. Uh, but we have put a lot of work into um, uh, meeting the other stakeholders of the company. And I would say that we are quite well integrated already. It's been only one year. So the, the team was formed uh, just in September 2020. So it's been only one year, but I think we managed to achieve a lot of things in this one year. From your experience, how much sharing is there between different pharma companies? I mean, sometimes when industries are young, people are saying, oh, we, we all are working together towards the same goal. And it may be at some point later, they say, oh, now we're really competing. But do you uh, collaborate? Do you share information with other pharma companies in, in any significant way? So we are part of several uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, but not only, also industry uh, consortia uh, that are uh, looking at quantum computing. Uh, So, of course, there is sharing and we try to discuss um, what are the interesting use cases uh, for us. Uh, But even though things are still uh, pre-competitive, I think very soon they will start uh, to be competitive. And, of course... All this work that is going behind the, the, the algorithms and the use cases, this is funded by our company or, you know, by somebody else's company. So it doesn't make sense that you would share everything with uh, everyone else, including with many companies that are interested. Uh, they might be curious, but they are actually not investing at all in quantum computing. Uh, so it is a bit of a, a kind of a funny situation where we do share uh, but overall, uh, it is kind of with a limited uh, bandwidth. And, and of course, we also keep stuff to ourselves. Other than more qubits with less noise, what else do you or the team need to make progress to, uh, to, to achieve even bigger business value? Um, this is actually a very big goal, <laughs> more qubits, uh, uh, also better connectivity, let's say, because you can have many qubits, but also uh, the, 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 how they are connected, it also, uh, it also matters uh, very much. Uh, so definitely we need the hardware improvement, but as many papers on resource estimates show, uh, we actually need the improvement in the algorithms. So 
If you look into the details of these papers, you can see that it would take still uh, more than a lifetime of a human uh, to calculate some of the fault tolerant algorithms on, you know, the imagined fault tolerant devices. So it's clearly not practical, even if one day we have this, um, let's say, a few thousand uh, error corrected qubits quantum computers, then we still don't know which algorithm to run on them because it will take such a long time to get the result even on that computer. So what we really need is uh, still an improvement in the algorithms and um, kind of smarter and faster ways to, uh, to, to manipulate the quantum information in order for that to become practical. And I think everyone that is serious about having uh, quantum computing value for their company and generating quantum computing value is really focusing also on the, um, uh, you know, photor and uh, algorithms development. When you design an algorithm for a particular computer, and let's assume it was a gate-based computer, how worried about are you about portability? Uh, are you willing to make it very, very specific to one vendor, or do you try to do something that can be easily ported to something else? Uh, overall, I think it's safe to say that we are very much hardware agnostic, so we don't really care what is the particular uh, hardware for implementing the, the qubits and the controls. Uh, so from this point of view, we don't, uh, we don't really care. And though the algorithms that we, um, we design can be implemented, for the moment we are looking at gate-based quantum computers, so all of them you know, can be translated to other gate-based uh, architectures. Um, in terms of having access to the hardware, uh, this is not something that we are uh, particularly, we think that it makes sense, let's say, to buy a computer, a quantum computer. Uh, we always uh, count on our partners to give us access to their hardware and to implement our algorithms and uh, use cases on, on their hardware through the cloud. We are at the at this time of the year that people talk about predictions. Uh, what are your predictions for quantum computing in 2022? What do you think will happen? I am very much uh, looking forward to seeing uh, even bigger uh, quantum platforms. Uh, they were uh, quite promising. Uh, like expectations for this year, for 2021. Uh, but I don't think we actually saw the promises already delivered. So I suppose that this will happen in 2022. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, some NISC architectures in the, in the qubit count above 100 qubits. So this will be really excellent. Um, probably also there will be uh, some exciting uh, uh, news from the business world. Uh, we'll have uh, other IPOs uh, for sure, and also a lot more capital uh, generated and uh, funds raised. Mm -hmm. On the algorithmic side, um, I expect also, because as I mentioned, I know many industry players are already hiring and really building quantum computing teams. So I also am uh, looking forward to seeing some new, uh, new algorithms for photo and quantum computers. As we get closer to the end of our discussion today, you mentioned that the team has five PhDs. And uh, when you grow it, are, I don't know if you're looking for additional PhDs. Do you think that's a problem? I mean, five PhDs, maybe 5% of the <laughs> eligible uh, people in the world to do the kind of work that you're looking for. Uh, yeah, but, you know, the truth is we are actually at a steady state and I don't think we will be growing uh, much more, uh, like, in the next uh, several years. As whether we would uh, still continue to add uh, people with the same profile that uh, the team currently has, I think this is very debatable and it really also depends on uh, what is the goal to add, like, what skill set do we need from the new people? Maybe if we want to go more applied, uh, even more applied, let's say, even more oriented towards the company, then we can hire someone with more pharmaceutical experience and so on. Uh, but I think for building up a quantum computing lab, it really made sense to, uh, to start by hiring uh, uh, quantum computing scientists. 
Elisa, how can people get in touch with you to learn more about your work? I'm very happy to connect with anyone. Um, mostly I use LinkedIn, so they can find me on LinkedIn with my name, Elitza Kiyoseva. Uh, they can send me a message or a, a connection request, and I usually accept those. Uh, so this is, I think, the easiest way to find me. I also participate in uh, some of the quantum computing uh, for business conferences. Uh, so uh, later this year, I'll also be uh, part of those, so I'll be happy if... Uh, you know, people come and uh, share their views with me uh, at the conferences as well. That's excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Yvonne. Good luck to you too.